All right, good morning, everybody. Hopefully, we'll all manage to wake up in the course of the lecture. What I want to talk about today with you is uh, the basic molecular and biochemical principles or metabolic principles of cancer therapy. Now, why, why this topic? Of course, this is not going to be a lecture on pharmacology or oncology, but this lecture really aims to connect together quite a lot of the knowledge that you gained during this course. So we'll use what you know already about cancer cells, and I'll try to show how we can use these specifics of cancer cells um, to help patients with cancer. Okay, so that's going to be the topic of lecture. And before we get to the details, let's try and review and summarize what differences there are between cancer cells and normal cells. Chromosomal aberrations. So there are chromosomal aberrations. Why do we have chromosomal aberrations? Why do we have more of them in cancer cells than in normal cells? Yeah? Same with DNA repair. Um, they allow that adhesion to other, so they can like, cause, um, they can go to other tissues, not only the tissues that they infringe. Okay, but staying with chromosomal aberrations, then the failure of the repair mechanism or impairment of the repair mechanism is a very, very important uh, feature of many cancer cells. And we'll see that that's one of the main uh, targets, we could say, um, the, one of the main factors that we use in cancer therapy, that cancer cells are less able to repair the DNA. But with chromosomal aberrations in cancer cells, another feature of cancer cells, of some cancer cells, is connected. And what about telomeres? Or did you say telomerase or telomeres? Okay. So some cancer cells express telomerase. Okay, that's true. Do you want to? Telomeres are not going to be shortening because if, uh, as we all are shortening with aging. And okay. Okay. So it's true that some cancer cells, but definitely not all of them, <coughs> do express telomerase. So that means that the telomeres can be extended indefinitely, and they do not reach what do we call this limit? Hayflick -like. -like limit. Okay. So they don't reach it, and they can they can uh, proliferate indefinitely. But actually, most cancer cells do not express telomerase. What happens then? They still keep dividing. So it starts impacting the DNA. Indeed. So their chromosomes are becoming shorter and shorter. The telomeres, after a few uh, rounds of division, they disappear. And they start cutting into the chromosomes, OK? Indeed, and the chromosomes, such modified, can actually start sticking to each other. And that is the other reason why we see so many chromosomal aberrations in cancer cells, because their telomeres are gone. Their chromosomes are getting shorter, and they start sticking to each other. And that's why you know, we have these weird chromosomes in many cancer cells. So telomerase is a feature of some cancer cells, but definitely not of all. All right, so we have chromosomal aberrations, impaired, uh, uh, impaired repair mechanisms. Uh, now, Clara, you mentioned the ability to move around the body, forming what? Metastasis. Very good. So there is met metastasizing. Not all cancers metastasize, most of them do. What other characteristics of cancer cells as opposed to normal cells do you know? Yes? Differentiation. Okay, so many cancer cells are less differentiated than, well, probably most cancer cells are less differentiated than normal cells. But again, there are different grades of differentiation for cancer. So we can have cancer that is very, very differentiated. And when you look at the, uh, the cells or the tissue under the microscope, they look virtually the same as the normal cells, only they grow in weird patterns, for example. And then there are some cancers that are completely undifferentiated, where basically, by looking at them, you can't tell what tissue they came from, because they're completely de-differentiated. So that's true. There was, yes? Um, they lack contact inhibition. OK, they lack contact inhibition. What does that mean for the growth of the, the cells? That they don't need as many signals from the cell cells, like normal cells. Okay, so either they don't need them or they just ignore them. 
Okay, so because a lot of the signals in contact inhibition are actually inhibitory, so they try to prevent the, the growth of cells, and cancer cells very often just, well actually in most of them, they just ignore them. They don't care about these, uh, these signals and they just grow, which obviously leads to um, destruction of the local area and then potentially metastasis as well. All right, what other characteristics of cancer cells do you know? Let's get a chance to someone else, yep. Uncontrolled proliferation, so that actually connects with a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that we said. What are, the, what are the reasons for uncontrolled proliferation in many cancer cells? What are the, uh, the underlying mechanisms? Okay, very good. So oftentimes there are mutations in proto-oncogenes forming oncogenes. And what are most oncogenes? Or proto-oncogenes, rather, okay. Signal related. Most of them are related to signaling cascades, and mostly signaling cascades of what? Um, either receptors or, uh, or what? Sure, or the other proteins that are involved in the signaling cascade, but my question was more about like the signaling cascades of which signaling molecules? So those are the types of receptors, and you're right, but... Oh, intrinsic and extrinsic factors? No, that's why we have those. No. Okay, let's everybody calm down a little bit. Yeah, I know it's exciting, but yeah. Growth factors, okay, that's what I was looking for, okay. So many of the proto-oncogenes that, that are mutated are uh, parts of signaling cascades for growth factors, and that explains why many cancers do not need more growth factor uh, stimulation for growth, unlike normal cells, okay. But again, this is not a feature that is common to all cancers. There are many cancers that are still dependent on some signaling molecules, and we'll see that, again, that's something that we can use in the treatment of some cancers. All right, what other things? Are there some metabolic differences in cancer cells? Okay, so in the old times, we would say that they don't use their mitochondria. Now we know that they indeed use their mitochondria. But there is something in what you say, and that mainly means that many cancer cells use a lot more glucose for the metabolism than normal cells. Um, and they don't use as much oxidative phosphorylation, which is one of the pathways in mitochondria, for uh, getting the ATP, okay? So this is something that people say, many cancer cells are glycolytic, okay? Because oftentimes they produce only pyruvate, sometimes lactate. Again, as we know now that more and more cancer types have been studied, this is not, again, a universal feature. So it's not true that all cancer cells are glycolytic, but it's true that many of them are. And indeed, this characteristic, this feature, is used in one diagnostic tool, in one imaging method to detect cancer, which you've heard about in biophysics. Which imaging method uses this you know, hunger for glucose in cancer cells? Indeed, PET scan, okay, positron emission tomography, because there we use fluorodeoxyglucose, labeled with fluorine 18, yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is the, the whole idea behind it, okay? Normal cells don't use as much glucose, cancer cells oftentimes, not all of them, use a lot of glucose, therefore we can pinpoint where fluorodeoxyglucose is accumulated using PET scan. All right, okay. There are many other metabolic features and other features of, of cancer cells. For example, um, a lot of cancer cells, due to their mutations and the chromosomal aberrations, produce a lot of completely incorrectly folded and incorrectly put together proteins. So they actually are producing a lot of proteins that don't make any sense and they have to destroy them again or, you know, stash them somewhere in some storage or something. What, I, what I'm trying to um, emphasize by this initial bit it's not only that there are indeed differences between cancer cells and normal cells, but also that cancer cells are not some kind of super cells, okay? Oftentimes people think that cancer cells are these super developed cells that can just do everything. That's not true. All cancer cells are actually really, really badly damaged, okay? They, they can't actually, they are not able to do a lot of functions that normal cells are able to do. Uh, they are very susceptible to some types of damage, not all of it, but some types of, uh, some types of damage they are more susceptible to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So do not think about cancer cells as these, you know, cells that know how to do everything. That's not true. 
they are badly damaged and we can use this damage and these deficiencies in cancer cells to destroy them more or less selectively as we'll see. All right. Um, Okay, so going to, coming to the topic of the, uh, of the lecture, talking about treatment of cancer, let's now think about the, uh, the, the modalities, the broad general methods, treatment methods that we can use to counter cancer. What are they? What, what, what approaches can we use to treat cancer, yeah? Okay, so there's radiation. What is the mechanism behind, behind using radiation to destroy cancer? How does it work? Okay, let's have someone, yep. Yeah. It does, and in what way? You're you're right. Okay. So most often in radiotherapy, we use ionizing radiation which comes into the, so we shine ionizing radiation ideally only on the tumor tissue, which is all usually not possible, but we try to only hit the, uh, the tumor, the tumor cells. And there the ionizing radiation causes the production of free radicals, mostly hydroxyl radical, which destroys the cells by damaging their DNA, et cetera, et cetera. So that's radiotherapy and there are many different kinds of it. And you've heard about some and you will hear about many more later, later on. So, Today, we're not going to deal with, with radiotherapy, but that's one modality, very good. What other modalities do we have? Hmm? We have chemotherapy, and that's gonna be the topic for today. So we're gonna be talking about chemotherapy mostly today. What other modalities, yeah? Indeed, <coughs> surgical treatment, just cutting the tumor out. Again, not always possible because sometimes the tumors, especially in advanced stages, have already grown into structures which just cannot be removed, either in the brain or, or in the chest or in the abdomen. When they start growing into major blood vessels, it's just not possible to cut them out, okay? But indeed, surgery, where it's possible, it's still, uh, it's probably the most effective treatment that we can have because if you can cut out everything, that's it, the person is, is cured. All right, what other modalities are there? Hmm? There's immunotherapy, and we'll mention it briefly today because this is becoming a major part of treatment nowadays. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about immunotherapy. Yeah? Well, yeah, I'm not sure there are any stem cell-based approaches to treating cancer. There are some cell-based, immune cell-based therapies, which we're probably not gonna talk about today, but we can mention it if we have time. But I think stem cell, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any stem cell based method, yeah? Gene therapy, again, that's usually connected with cell therapy. So now we have, there, is, there are methods where we can use uh, genetically modified or genetically enhanced immune cells uh, that we take from the patient, modify them, grow them, and then put them back. So, so yes, gene therapy can be part of it, definitely. Yeah. Right, uh, okay, well you can, okay, that is a stem cell therapy, you're right. So it's bone marrow transplant, transplant, which is, yes, hematopoic stem cells, okay. When we said stem cells, I was more thinking about embryonic stem cells, which we can develop into any kind of cell. Yes, in, in bone marrow transplantation, of course, that these are hematopoic stem cells. Anyway, um, I think those are the basic methods. We could talk also about some metabolic methods that are also develop, being developed now, so targeting metabolism, but we'll really not mention them today, so this is just another, uh, another possibility. All right, so the main area of cancer treatment that we'll talk about today is chemotherapy, or cytotoxic anti-cancer therapy. Uh, as the name suggests, cytotoxic, uh, the idea behind all the well, virtually all the chemicals that we're going to talk about today is to kill cells. Now, for most, of the, uh, for most of these methods, for most of these medications that we'll talk about, there is very little possibility to target these to toxic effects only on the cancer cells. So with most of these treatments, we do unfortunately damage or kill even normal cells. Okay, so the ability to distinguish between the two for most of these is either impossible or very difficult. 
So that also will explain and we'll talk about some of the side effects uh, that occur with chemotherapy. And probably some of them you already know, just like hair from... Loss. Okay, there's hair loss. Okay, why, why is there hair loss in many anti-cancer treatments? Not all of them, but many... Okay, indeed. Okay, the cells in the hair follicle are among the, the, the quickest proliferating cells in the body. And since many of the treatments, as we'll see, target cells that proliferate very quickly, you know, hair loss is, is one of the side effects. What other cells proliferate Skin. very quickly? Hmm? Skin. Skin cells are not among the, f with the fastest turnover, actually. Blood. There's blood, so, so talking about bone marrow, rather. It's not really blood, but bone marrow, indeed, okay. Now, when you say stomach, okay, and when you say stomach, you probably mean, hmm? Okay, we could say GI, but mostly it's the intestine, small intestine, and to some extent, large intestine. In stomach, the turnover is not actually that quick, but for small intestine, the turnover is about three days, so there's a very, very quick turnover of the epithelium. So GI tract, indeed, <laughs> bone marrow, and hair follicles are among the main targets for, as of side effects for these, for these treatments, as we'll see in a second. All right, so talking about chemotherapy, now there have been for thousands of years, of course, local traditional therapies that were used to treat what we nowadays call cancer, uh, and some of them are now being developed into drugs, but we're not gonna talk about this prehistory of cancer therapy. But the modern cancer chemotherapy actually starts in 1917. In 1917, in Europe, what was going on? There was World War I. Uh, and World War I was the first war where chemical warfare was used, uh, poisonous gas. Uh, and the main poisonous gas that was used throughout the war, since 1915, I think, was chlorine. Okay, so chlorine was something that by 1917 was a well-known chemical gas that was used by everybody. It wasn't just Germany. Everybody was using it, the Allies or Germany. So, um, so chlorine was something that the soldiers knew. But then in, I think in July, in July of 1917, uh, the German army uh, bombarded some positions of the Allied forces in Belgium. Uh, with some shells, you know, there were some explosions, but no gas was visible. Because chlorine, as you know, is green, so everybody could see it, but here they couldn't <coughs> see anything. So the, the presumed gas, they didn't know there was gas, but the presumed gas was completely invisible, um, which meant, first of all, that they couldn't use any protection for it because they didn't see it when it was coming. But the other problem was, which they noticed only a few hours later, that this new gas, because then they knew that something was going on, actually did not attack only the lungs as chlorine would, okay? So you just use a gas, gas mask for, for chlorine and you're fine. But this new gas actually was able to penetrate the skin everywhere, even in places that were covered by uniform. So basically in these soldiers that were exposed to, these new, new, uh, to, to this new gas, uh, huge blisters and chemical burns developed and many of them died after the attack. Now, uh, the the gas later on was named after the specific smell that it has, and it's called mustard gas, because it smells a little bit like mustard, okay? At that, point, at that time, they didn't know what was going on, so they couldn't name it, but later on, it was called mustard gas. The German army actually called it something else. They had like a code uh, name for it. Um, but why am I talking about the story of mustard gas? Well. In the necropsies of the soldiers that died in these gas attacks for, caused by mustard gas, um, the physicians who, who performed the necropsies noticed, in addition to these chemical burns and blisters, etc., and damage to the, uh, to the lungs, uh, they noticed that their uh, white blood cell count were very low, okay, which was unexpected, which was strange. Why would this gas attack white blood cells or bone marrow or whatever? They had no idea. So, I'm just going to show you the structure of mustard gas because this will become important. So this is what was used in Belgium 1917 and then till the end of the war. Um, this molecule is a very volatile liquid and actually change, turns into gas very easily. Uh, and it is extremely reactive, okay, as we'll see in a second what it actually does. 
So anyway, um, so these necropsies show that white blood cell counts were very low. And after the war in, in the 1930s and 40s, especially, some of the physicians in, uh, in the United States thought about using a chemical like this to treat some of the cancers where white blood cell counts are too high. Okay, so things like leukemias or lymphomas. Okay, they were thinking, okay, well, this, here we have a compound that can decrease white blood cell counts. Why not try and use it to treat some white blood cell-based uh, cancers? Now, they didn't, in the end, use mustard gas because it's very, very, very reactive and very dangerous, so there would be virtually no way to give it to a patient because it would just damage everything. Um, so they used a very closely related chemical, a chemical weapon that was developed by the Allies, by the United States and, and the UK, which looked like this. So it's almost the same thing as the original mustard gas, but here the sulfur was changed for nitrogen, and there's a methyl group here. These compounds were called nitrogen mustards, because they are mustard gas, but with nitrogen. So they were called nitrogen mustards, and there are a lot of them. And this specific one was called mechlorethamine. Mechlorethamine. Now, since it was a chemical we weapon, all the research into this treatment of lymphoma, they were actually using it to treat lymphoma, was all top secret, it was all classified. It was only declassified after the Second World War. But anyway, in 1942, I think, they gave the first injection of me mechlorethamine to a patient who had a massive lymphoma on his neck. And the lymphoma was basically making it impossible for the, for the, uh, for the patient to eat and sleep, and he was basically dying. And they gave a couple of injections of mechlorethamine. The tumor shrunk massively, it became a very, very small tumor. Um, and the patient lived another six months, pretty much a good quality life, okay? He died afterwards from the, from the disease anyway, because the treatment at that point was not developed as well to actually cure him. Uh, but anyway, but it was, it was the first use of a modern chemotherapeutic agent in cancer. Mechlorethamine is still used today to treat some cancers. It's not widely used. Now there are more modern variations on this theme, but it's still used nowadays so you can, <coughs> maybe if you later on go into oncology, you may still find mechlorethamine uh, used. These days, we have other molecules which basically, which are based on the same chemical structure and the same mechanism, and we call all these all these chemicals that do the same thing and are chemically similar, alkylating agents. Alkylating agents. Why are they called alkylating agents? Their mechanism of effect is actually, in many ways, very, very simple. These highly reactive chloroethyl groups just covalently bind to nucleic acids. They bind to the, mostly to the amino groups of guanine nucleotides, of guanine bases, and they stick to the, to the amino group, and by this they modify the base in a covalent manner, so this whole thing basically attaches to the guanine and stays there. Now for all of the cells where this happens, and again, this is something that happens in all the cells, not just in the cancer cells, but what the cells in which nucleic acids are modified by these alkylating agents happens is that, of course, it is recognized as an error and needs to be cut out and repaired. However, we just said in the beginning that the repair mechanisms in most cancer cells are not as efficient as in normal cells. And this is the reason why we can use chemicals like this to at least try to target it more, the damage to the cancer cells rather than normal cells, okay? All DNA in all cells will be modified, but we hope that the cancer cells will suffer more and will start dying more than the, uh, than the normal cells. But again, the side effects, as we mentioned them, do occur with these alkylating agents, of course, because the DNA gets damaged in all of them, all right? Now, the, the most commonly Nowadays, the most commonly used alkylating agents are not mechlorethamine, but actually a compound called cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide. 
cyclophosphamide, which is still based on this structure of mustard gas, only instead of the methyl group here, there is a relatively complicated ring structure at it. Okay, I'm not gonna draw the structure. But why am I mentioning cyclophosphamide? The interesting thing about cyclophosphamide, which you will probably come across with in any area of medicine, because it's also used as a very effective immunosuppressant, so it's used for other, other um, uh, indications than just to treat cancer. The interesting thing about cyclophosphamide is that as a molecule, cyclophosphamide is not reactive. It does not do anything. It's not toxic. It only turns into this reactive thing when it is metabolized in the liver. So it is something that we call a prodrug. Okay? So you can take cyclophosphamide in a pill form or, or in an infusion without damaging any tissues. It's fine, it doesn't do anything. Then it goes into the liver, there it turns into this super reactive, very toxic thing, and then it goes into the body and starts killing the cells. So it makes it a lot easier to administer and there is less likelihood of damaging some personnel or tissues or whatever that, uh, do not, that we do not want to uh, be damaged, okay? So cyclophosphine is a prodrug, but turns into something like this. All right. Now, relating to alkylating, uh, related to alkylating agents, but not quite an alkylating agent, is another very, very widely used chemotherapeutic agent, chemotherapeutic, uh, chemotherapeutic drug, uh, which is currently used for many, many types of tumors. And this drug looks like this. Now, could somebody say what kind of compound this is? Yep. Sorry? A cis compound. Okay, it is cis, you're correct. Hmm? It's a complex, it's a complex of which element? Yeah, of platinum, okay, of platinum with four ligands. The, the oxidative state of platinum is two in this one, okay, because we have two, chloride, my, uh, two chlorides and, uh, and two amino groups. And this compound is called cisplatin. Cisplatin and its derivatives, there are some other ones, oxaliplatin, et cetera, et cetera, are, again, amongst the most widely used anti-cancer agents today. Uh, they're mostly used to treat what we call solid tumors, so not blood tumors, but tumors that are actually solid, things like ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, etc. So very, very widely used. Now, I said that this compound is close to alkylating agents, but it's not an alkylating agent. Why is it not an alkylating agent? Indeed, there's no alkyl group, right? There, there's no hydrocarbon group there, so it cannot actually alkylate and bind, uh, well, it can bind an alkyl group. But it's related to alkylating agents because it does basically the same thing. It goes into the DNA, it binds to mostly to guanine uh, nucleotides, and it actually not only binds to one of them, but it's capable of binding two guanines together. Using these coordination bonds, so it's not really covalent bond, it's coordination bond, but this coordination bond is very strong. It's strong enough to actually keep the DNA together, okay? So cisplatin works in a very similar way as an alkylating agent, it co well, not covalently, this time is coordination, bo uh, coordination bond, uh, but it very strongly binds to DNA and damages it, okay? Binds it together, modifies it, so that the cell is unable to manipulate with the DNA, it's unable to replicate it, or it has to cut it out and repair it, okay? So cisplatin, in a way, belongs among alkylating, agent, even though, uh, alkylating agents, even though it does not alkylate, so it's not really one of them, okay? It's a pseudo-alkylating agent. All right. Uh, do you have any questions about these alkylating agents and their mechanisms of effect? <coughs> Is it clear? Yep. Are you still asleep? Just nod your head if you are. 
Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next group of compounds. And this is a very large one, and we call it anti-metabolites. What does it mean? These compounds, and again, there are many, many, many of them, interfere with the metabolism of nucleic acids. Okay? So, as we'll see, there are many, many possible ways how we can interfere with nucleic acid uh, metabolism. Uh, and these antimetabolites basically do that. Okay? Many of them interfere with the metabolism of nucleotides, and some of them interfere with the metabolism or with trafficking the, uh, the DNA or nucleic acids in total. All right. One of the most widely used subgroups of anti, uh, of anti metabolites are antifolic agents. Antifolic agents. What does it mean? These are compounds that interfere with the metabolism of folic acid. Why would an interference with folic acid metabolism? cause problems with nucleic acid metabolism. Let's try someone else. Yeah. Okay, it's needed for the synthesis of nucleotides. And which ones and how? Okay, so for pure nucleotides, it's needed where? Folic acid? Or which part of the synthesis needs folic acid? Do you remember? Does anyone remember? Yeah? Hmm? Well, it does, it but is it just adenosine? No, the, the ring also needs the semen. Okay, so for purine metabolism, we actually need tetrahydrofolate in the formal tetrahydrofolate form. We need it to build the purine ring. So all purines require folic acid, okay, or tetrahydrofolate, okay? All of them do because we're, we need it to build the purine ring. It's not just adenosine, but all of them. How about pyrimidines? Only thymidine, okay? So for pyrimidines, we don't need to try to folate to build the ring, but we only need it to donate the methyl groups for th thymidine synthesis, okay? So if we can disrupt the metabolism of folic acid, we can disrupt the, the synthesis of all purines and of thymidine, okay? That's the logic behind it. The most widely used anti-folic agent is called methotrexate. And methotrexate, in addition to being used in cancer therapy, is also used as an, as an immune suppressing agent. Anyone coming? No. Um, as immunosuppressive agent, because again, by suppressing the proliferation of cells, we can also suppress the proliferation of white blood cells in autoimmune diseases. But that's just an aside, okay? So methotrexate is used also for other things. What is the mechanism of effect of methotrexate? It's actually an inhibitor of a very important enzyme in folic acid synthesis or folic acid metabolism, which is called dihydrofolate reductase. Dihydrofolate reductase. What does dihydrofolate reductase do? Why do we need it? Yep. Indeed, as the name suggests, it reduces dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. And as you all know, the only active form of folic acid is tetrahydrofolate. All the other ones, all the other forms like folic acid or dihydrofolic acid are unusable in metabolism. So we need to first reduce it to tetrahydrofolate and then we can charge it with formyl group or methyl group or whatever you know, uh, in order to use it in the synthesis. So if we can inhibit dihydrofolate reductase, that means that we deprive cells from having to try to folate to, uh, to synthesize purines and, and thymidine. Okay, that's the logic behind it. And indeed, this is what happens. So by giving patients methotrexate, we stop cells from producing these nucleotides. 
And once again, we stop this metabolism in all cells because all cells contain the same dihydrofolate reductase and the inhibition is going to be general. Okay? It's not going to be specific to cancer cells. However, oncologists develop a very clever method how to uh, weaponize, we could say, another defect of some cancer cells. Certain cancer cells have very inefficient transport mechanisms for folic acid. Okay? So as we said, most cancer cells are damaged. And one of the damages that some cancer cells have is that they are very bad at importing folic acid. It takes them a long time to import folic acid, unlike normal cells, which are very good at it. So a special type of protocol, a special type of therapy was developed with methotrexate, which uses this difference between cancer cells and normal cells. How does it work? The patient is first given a lethal dose of methotrexate. It's a dose that would normally kill the person completely because it would stop the proliferation of all the cells and usually the person would die because their bone marrow would, is suppressed and there is a severe anemia that kills them. Okay? A few hours after this massive dose of methotrexate, the patient is given an antidote to methotrexate, which is basically 4-mil tetrahydrofolate. Okay? So dihydrofolate reductase is blocked everywhere because we gave a massive dose of methotrexate, but we give already prepared 4-mil uh, uh, tetrahydrofolate, which the cells that are able to import it import and therefore they circumvent the inhibition of this enzyme. They don't need dihydrofolate reductase because they already have tetrahydrofolate coming in from the outside. Cancer cells, however, the ones that have impaired uh, import mechanisms for dihydrofolate or for folic acid derivatives are unable to do that and they die because they cannot import enough of this antidote. Okay, does it make sense how this special protocol works? Just nod your head if it makes sense, because otherwise it looks like you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. All right? Okay. Still, many people don't seem to know what I'm talking about, but <laughs> do you want me to say it again, or? No, methotrexate is the inhibitor of DHFR, okay, of dihydrofolate reductase. So we give a massive dose of methotrexate and we block dihydrofolate reductase in all cells in the body, okay? There's just so much methotrexate that no tetrahydrofolate is produced anywhere in the body, okay? A few hours afterwards, we give a very large dose of already prepared 4-mil tetrahydrofolate. But only normal cells are able to efficiently import it and use it. Okay? And therefore, they can still continue producing their purine and pyrimidine uh, nucleotides because they, they use this exogenous formal tetrahydrofolate, while cancer cells that cannot efficiently import it, they die or they, can, they at least stop proliferating, if nothing else. Okay? The antidote formal tetrahydrofolate that is used has also a drug name. Okay? So it's, it's formal tetrahydrofolate, but it actually has a name as a drug, and it's called leucovorin. So leucovorin is just a different name for formal tetrahydrofolate that we can give to patients. And how long ago was that developed? Because it sounds like you need a lot of research to find out. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this method actually exists at least a few decades. It's a pretty old method, yes? Is it uh, yeah, it's, it's fairly effective. It's mostly used for leukemias, so not for solid tumors, which don't seem to be as good. But for, for some leukemias, it, it's still used as a, as a possible method. Now there are newer methods and in many ways less damaging methods. Because even though it looks like nothing happens to the patient, well, it still produces quite unpleasant side effects. So it can still be used in some settings, but now we have some newer methods that in some cases are more effective and less, less damaging. But it's, it's a fairly old method, actually. Uh, yeah. All right. The last thing I'll say about, yes? Yeah, I would like to ask, so the cancer cells, 
they uh, absorb the methotrophsate in normal rate? Pretty much. Yeah, sometimes it's a little bit slower because the structure of methotrexate, actually those of you who are really interested in chemical structures, you can look it up. It's very similar to folic acid. It's actually almost folic acid only with two methyl groups or one amino group, one methyl group. So the, the import of methotrexate is actually a little bit slower as well in the cancer cells, which makes it not as great as I just described it, okay? I described it like, oh, it's a magic bullet, you know, it just works perfectly well. It's true that the cancer cells usually have a slower intake of methotrexate. That's why we have to give a massive dose, okay, so that it gets all into the cancer cells as well. Okay. There's still much more uh, rate than the form that are high in polyp absorption. It usually is, yes. Okay. Yep. Because we give them antidote. But is that lower is enough? Yeah, it, it is, absolutely. Yes, because the most cells are not proliferating, they're not synthesizing DNA all the time, okay? So, you know, it's not something that, like, if we inhibited their mitochondria, they would die immediately, of course. But here, it's not something that the cells need all the time. All right. Last thing I'll say about dihydrofolate reductase inhibitors is that you'll, you'll see dihydrofolate reductase also inhibitors also in a different context because there do exist dihydrofolate reductase inhibitors that are used in antimicrobial therapy. That's not antibiotic, but it's antimicrobial uh, chemotherapy, we could say. <clears throat> because the, uh, bacteria need folic acid to try to folate for exactly the same reasons as we do. So we can use specific bacterial inhibitors of dihydrofolate reductase that can kill only bacteria because they do not affect the, uh, the mammalian enzyme. So we can use specific uh, inhibitors only of the uh, microbial enzyme, and we can use them to kill bacteria. And indeed, there is one called trimethoprim. Trimethoprim, uh, which is an inhibitor of bacterial dihydrofolate reductase, and is used to treat infections, urinary infections, usually in com combination with sulfonamides or some other inhibitors of folic acid metabolism. Okay, so this is just uh, showing how useful dihydrofolate reductase can be. For the inhibitors of the mammalian enzyme, we can use them to slow proliferation of cancer cells or normal cells. And for the uh, inhibitors of the bacterial enzyme, we can use it to treat bacterial infections. And it's quite possible that many of you have actually taken trimethoprim um, for some infections. All right. Any questions about anti-folic agents? Is it clear? Is it clear how it binds together with your knowledge of nucleotide metabolism? Good. So let's take a four minute break and we'll continue. All right, let's uh, continue with the lecture. The break was quite a bit longer than four minutes. <clears throat> All right, so we're now continuing talking about anti-metabolites, about drugs that interfere with the metabolism of nucleic acids. And I've drawn here three structures of three molecules that are actually used as anti-metabolic agents in treating cancer and some other conditions. And what I want you to do now in twos, threes, however you're sitting, to look at them, take about three minutes, to look at them and think about what normal nucleotide or base do they resemble? What are the differences between the normal molecule and this molecule? And just think about what possible mechanisms of effect could there be for this compound? How could it be an anti-metabolite, okay? Hopefully it will be from the structures. You should be able to figure it out, but we'll see how it works. Okay, so let's take three minutes, talk about it in two, threes, um, and we'll see. Yeah, so you're going to go to the table and have a short day and then
I know. But remember, Of the what? Because I know for the purines and purines, like most. Like one, once you know the structure of purine, then it's very easy to know the substitutes, right? But anyway, let's have a look at these. There are three molecules. Okay, let's think about. All right, so it feels like most of you have had time to discuss this. So, talking about the first compound, which normal base does it look like? Okay, so this idea of the suggestion of adenine, any other suggestion? Hmm? Xanthine? Okay, so we have adenine, xanthine. Hmm? Quanine? It does. And without the O, it's called? No. Oh, the other xanthine. Yeah, the other one, I don't know. Correct. The closest equivalent of this compound is hyposanthine. Because those of you who suggested adenine, I understand why you would say that, because adenine, what is the difference from adenine here? Okay, so here would be NH2 instead of SH. But actually, in chemical terms, sulfur is not very similar to nitrogen. It's actually very similar to oxygen, okay? So instead of sulfur, imagine that there's oxygen there. In that case, it's hypoxanthine. Okay, so this is a, an analog, a derivative of hypoxanthine, where we switch the oxygen here for sulfur. The name of the compound is actually much simpler than that. It's called 6 mercaptopurine So it's a purine, and this is a mercapto group. So it's called 6 mercaptopurine What do you think could be the mechanism of effect of this compound? Why could it interfere with the synthesis of nucleotides or of DNA, or how could it? And this is, this is actually pretty hard, but if you have any suggestions, yeah? Isn't actually, so a question, isn't it actually an antidote, right? You mentioned? No, it's an anti-metabolite. Oh. It's not an antidote, okay? okay? It's, one of, it's another cancer-treating drug which interferes with the synthesis of nucleotides. Yeah. So it could be mistaken by mm -hmm. a death cert or a or hypo zenting and then be incorporated into DNA and therefore create the damage that will be recognized. Indeed. This is one of the mechanisms of 6 mercaptopurine. So it gets actually turned into a nucleotide using the hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, the salvage pathway, <laughs> you all remember, I'm sure. Um, so it gets turned into a nucleotide, 
and then incorporates into both RNA and DNA. Interestingly, the mercaptopurine and a very closely related thioguanine, which basically has just an amino group here, so thioguanine is another possible thing, so they incorporate into the DNA, but as such, they do not seem to cause huge problems. They still base pair normally, they look like the real stuff, okay, interestingly. But what does happen is that this sulfur here becomes very easily methylated, okay? You know that methylation of various bases is a way of modulating gene expression? Yeah, okay. What is interesting is that the sulfur is more reactive and it becomes methylated even without any enzymes. It spontaneously becomes methylated. Do you remember what the donor of the methyl group is for this DNA methylation? It's S-adenosylmethionine. And in S-adenosylmethionine, the methyl group is also connected to sulfur. Okay? It looks like this. So the transfer of the methyl group from this sulfur to this sulfur is very easy, and it happens without any enzyme. Okay? So the more mercaptopurine or thioguanine or whatever we have in the DNA, the more methylated it becomes. And it becomes a problem for the cells because they start detecting this methylated thio base as an error. They cut it out, and we are back to this story where the, where the cancer cells are unable to repair it properly, and their DNA becomes very, very damaged. Okay? So this appears to be one of the main mechanisms through which mercaptopurine and its close, closely related molecules interfere with, with DNA metabolism. The other mechanism by which this compound interferes with nucleotide metabolism is that it's a very good inhibitor of the first enzyme, the first dedicated enzyme in the synthesis of purines. Which one would that be? Hmm? So this molecule inhibits the first step which is really dedicated to purine synthesis. That's the end of the pathway. I'm talking about the first step. So inosine monophosphate is the end of it, okay? The transferase? The what? And transferase what? Very good, okay, very well read indeed, <laughs> uh, okay? The first step in the sense of purines, as you hopefully will remember, is because purines are built already on the phosphoribosyl bit, okay? So the phosphoribose is there, and then first we add an amino group, and then we start building the whole ring. So this is the first step that actually makes it dedicated to purine synthesis, okay? So indeed, it's the amido transferase, the phosphoribosyl amido transferase, which is inhibited by mercaptopurine. Okay, so by inhibiting that, we decrease the synthesis of purines. So mercaptopurine and its related compounds have actually two different effects, okay? And it's very interesting because these compounds have been used for maybe 50 years in therapy or so, and the exact mechanisms are still a bit unclear, okay? So this is what you find in the literature, these two mechanisms, but in every paper where they write about these mechanisms, they say like, uh, actually, maybe there are some other ones and we're not quite sure. So this is just another illustration that we can use something for 50 years and still in treatment and still be unclear about what it actually does. But it works, you know. Good. Let's talk about the second compound. What does it look like? Hmm? Sorry? Really? How could it be uridine monophosphate when there's no sugar there and no phosphate? And why is it deoxy? So what does, what, the, what does uracil look like? No, uracil looks like this. So it's not deoxyuracil, okay? It looks like uracil. There were some suggestions here that it looks like thymine, but it doesn't. 
the fluorine atom, even though here it looks like it's sticking out, but the fluorine atom is a very, very small atom. For most enzymes, it looks exactly the same as hydrogen. Most enzymes are unable to distinguish between fluorine and hydrogen because they are very, very small. So in fact, I could just hide this, and for the enzymes it looked the same, okay? So it, it actually looks like uracil, okay? It differs only by the fluorine here, so in fact the name is 5-fluorouracil. <clears throat> now what could the mechanism of effect here be? Where could it interfere? So as I said, for all enzymes, the fluorine looks like hydrogen. They will mistake it for, for uracil, they will incorporate it everywhere, and even incorporated in RNA, it behaves, it behaves like a normal RNA. It base pairs normally, it doesn't really do anything there. Because as I said, the fluorine is so small that it doesn't make any difference. But it's one reaction where it makes a massive difference. Not really, no, but you're heading in the right direction. So with the synthesis of cysteine, there's nothing to do because that you know, happens there, but. Hmm? Ribonucleotide reductase acts on the ribose, which even isn't here, but even if it were, why would this fluorine interfere with what happens here? That's just too far away. But there's one reaction that actually occurs exactly on this carbon. Indeed, the synthesis of thymine or thymidine. Because what happens there is, in the synthesis of thymidine, because as you will remember, thymine, thymidine is not synthesized just from the base, but we first have to actually make the deoxynucleotide and then it happens. But what happens there is normally here it's hydrogen. The enzyme that methylates it pulls away the hydrogen and puts in the methyl group. From what? What is the donor of the methyl group? Okay, it's methylene to try to folate, but good enough, all right. So the enzyme pulls away the hydrogen and puts in the methyl group. However, the bond between fluorine and, and carbon is much stronger. And the enzyme is unable, it tries to pull it away, but it's unable to actually do that. So 5-fluorouracil actually acts as an inhibitor of thymidine synthase. Okay, and if we give it to cells, they are unable to produce thymidine, and if they don't have thymidine, they can't do what? Yeah, they can't make DNA, right? They need thymidine for DNA, so they cannot synthesize the DNA and they cannot replicate. Okay, so that's the idea for using that. Interestingly, most cells are very sensitive to thymidine levels. Not to other nucleotide levels, but thymidine seems to be this this uh, measure of how much nucleotides you have. So as th in most cells, as, as thymidine levels drop, the cells usually sense it and they apoptose. They start apoptosis if there's not enough thymidine. So based on the mechanism, you would just say the cells would stop proliferating, but actually many of them are apoptose because they don't have enough thymidine and it's something that they need in order to survive. Okay, so this is just an interesting, let's say, side thing. Good. What about the last compound? What does it resemble? What does it look like? Okay, so it looks like cytidine, not cytosine, right? We have a sugar there, so it looks like cytidine. In what way does it differ from cytidine? Sorry? And what about them? Very good. If we had cytidine in which the sugar is, is ribose, okay, the OH group would be here and not here. So this is normal cytosine, there's no difference here, but the sugar is different. Does anyone know which sugar this is? 
it's arabinose, very good. Okay, it's arabinose, which is just an epimer of, of ribose. And this compound is called cytarabine or arabinosyl cytosine. Okay, so it looks like cytidine, but it isn't really. The only thing different here is the configuration of this OH bond, uh, sorry, of this OH group. What could the mechanism of effect here be? How could this compound confuse the cellular metabolism? It can do, and then it causes a problem. How? Because of the OH group, okay? It may not look like it. So basically what happens is three, three phospho groups get added here, so it, it becomes a triphosphate, and DNA polymerase will try to connect it onto a new, uh, uh, a new strand of DNA. But then there becomes a problem, because for the DNA polymerase, this looks weird, okay? It doesn't recognize this as a normal ribose, okay? Even though the next bit should come here, which, is, which looks like a normal OH group, but this whole thing looks too different for the enzyme to actually continue building the, uh, the strand, okay? So this actually terminates the strand propagation in, in DNA synthesis of DNA polymerase, okay? And this is how it stops the um, uh, the proliferation of cells. All right? So these were three examples of anti-metabolites where we can see that there's a very close similarity to the real stuff, but there's a subtle difference which causes it to destroy the, uh, the cells eventually, okay? So a little illustration, and there are many, many more compounds like this that are, that are still used to treat either cancer or some other conditions by using these mechanisms. All right, do you have any questions about these? Does it make sense how you can use your knowledge of metabolism and your knowledge of structures to figure it out? Yep. The fluorouracil also will incorporate it into the DNA? It will get, not to DNA, because there's no uracil in DNA, but to RNA. Yes. Um, it will, but first of all, RNA only lives very shortly, so it doesn't really cause a huge amount of problems. But also, this fluorouracil, once it's in RNA, it looks like uracil the cell doesn't even know that there is fluorouracil there. So it doesn't cause any kind of you know, problems with protein synthesis or nothing like that. So that's, it does get incorporated, but it doesn't really cause any problems. So the main effect is uh, like reducing the amount of time. In Indeed, production. correct, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? No? All right, so we can move on to the next group of chemicals that can be used to treat cancer. And this is, again, a fairly large group, and it's gonna be compounds that interfere with the manipulation with DNA. So no, it's not its synthesis or synthesis of its building blocks, but actually manipulating with DNA. And as you will know, especially in uh, cell division, there are a lot of things that you have to do with, or, and also in replication, you have to actually physically move the DNA around and, you know, uh, remove the double-stranded nature, et cetera. So there are a lot of things that you actually have to do in order for the cells to, um, uh, to grow, and we have compounds that can interfere with that. The first group that I want to talk about are topoisomerase inhibitors. Topoisomerase inhibitors. What are topoisomerases? What do they do? They create double strand breaks. Mm, some of them do. So they create breaks in DNA, that's correct. Some of them are single stranded, some of them are double stranded. But what is the purpose of that? Why do we need topoisomerases? DNA is super coiled. And why is it super coiled? Is this something that everybody knows about? So we have the double-stranded DNA, and if we want to replicate it, or actually even for transcription, we have to unwind it. Yep. Now, the DNA is attached to other structures in chromosomes, 
okay? And it's very long. As you know, in each cell, we have two meters of DNA. It's a very, very long molecule. So you can imagine, as we try to unwind the, uh, the double-stranded DNA, it actually becomes, as you say, supercoil, which is actually a term that may not be very clear, but it just gets clumped together because the tension in the molecule increases. You can imagine if you just twist two bits of rope and you attach them to a pole, and then you start pulling them apart, what will happen? Well, the tension increases, increases, and in the end, the whole thing just becomes a big clumped mess. Is that something that you can imagine? Maybe, all right? So this is exactly what happens with DNA. And we need topoisomerases to actually cut the molecule, this clumped, supercoiled molecule, to cut it and allow the tension to be released so that we can continue with unwinding the, the DNA for replication uh, and other things. Is it clear what topoisomerases do? Yeah? We have two types of topoisomerases. We have topoisomerases 1 and topoisomerases 2. Okay? Topoisomerases 1 only produce single strand breaks and, really, and allow the, the molecule to unwind spontaneously. Topoisomerases 2 create double stranded breaks. And then, you, then they use ATP, they use, they use energy producing molecules, to actually take the, the part of the supercoiled molecule, pull it through the double stranded break, and then, then, then close it. Okay, this is something you covered most likely in the first course, I assume, or maybe in the last course? Yeah, in the last course. All right, okay, so these are very fundamental mechanisms without which the cell will die because it's unable to proliferate, it's unable to do its normal, uh, its normal functions. So if we can inhibit topoisomerases, we can kill the cells, and primarily we'll kill the cells that are proliferating the most, or that are, you know, using their DNA the most, okay? The quiescent cells like neurons will not be really touched by them. Right, so I want to mention two compounds or groups of compounds that belong in this group of topoisomerase inhibitors. The first one are anthracyclines, or anthracycline antibiotics. And the, probably the most used member of this pathway is called doxorubicin. Why are they called anthracyclines? Because they contain uh, an anthracine structure, three rings and then some oxygens on them, so that's just a chemical name. And why are they called antibiotics? Because they are produced by uh, these fungi, these molds or whatever, uh, to kill other microbes, okay, as antibiotics, as all antibiotics are produced by bacteria or by fungi to kill other stuff. So this is exactly what doxorubicin is used for. This, that's how we develop. Doxorubicin and all the anthracyclines are topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. They're topoisomerase 2 inhibitors and I explained before what the mechanism is. What's interesting about these anthracycline, uh, anthracycline antibiotics, that they are also what we call intercalating agents. They actually go into the DNA because there's the flat anthracine ring, and they go into the DNA, they kind of slot between the nucleotides and further impair any manipulation, any opening of the molecule because they kind of pull them together by just using hydrophobic interactions. Now, intercalating agent, does that ring a bell? You actually used an intercalating agent for your nucleic acid practicals to stain the DNA. Does anyone remember what it was? What was this fluorescent thing called that you used to stain DNA? Yeah, sort of. Close. <laughs> it was called ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide. And ethidium bromide is also an intercalating agent. It goes into the, the nucleic acid and sticks to it and fluoresces. That's why we use it for detecting DNA. So doxorubicin does a very similar thing. So in addition to inhibiting topoisomerase 2, it also goes into the DNA. It also fluoresces, but that's not really why we use it now. Uh, and impairs the manipulation with the DNA. So it has actually dual, dual effect. 
When you go much, much later on to oncology wards, you may ask them to show you a bottle of infusion with doxorubicin. It's a very brilliant, dark red color. It's quite interesting. That's why it's called a rubicin, because it's red, uh, and it's quite nice color. So later on in oncology, you can have a look at that. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, for the topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, I'll just mention a compound called topotecan. So this is topo 1 inhibitor, and it does a very similar thing. It's not an intercalating agent, really, um, but it inhibits topoisomerase 2, uh, so topoisomerase 1. Now, this again is a just an aside, okay, so don't worry about it, you don't have to write it down. But we also have topoisomerase 1 inhibitors. So remember when we talk about dihydrofolate reductase inhibitors, methotrexate, I said that we also have specific DHFR uh, uh, inhibitors just for bacteria. So similar to that, we also have topoisomerase 1 inhibitors specific only for bacteria, and we use them to treat bacterial infections. Those are called fluoroquinolones. And you may have, again, had them for infection. They're, they have names that usually end with floxacin. Okay, so there is ofloxacin, so ciprofloxacin. So the cipro, that is, is a, probably a well-known thing for diarrhea or something. Cipro, maybe if you travel, some, somebody may have recommended that you take ciprofloxacin with you to treat tropical diarrhea, whatever. So these are actually topoisomerase 1 inhibitors, but only specific for the bacterial protein. So they will not cause damage to our cells, but only to bacterial cells. But that's just an aside for uh, fluoroquinolones. Yeah, in fact, they actually do cause damage to our cells because our bacterial, uh, sorry, our mitochondrial uh, DNA handling me mechani uh, mechanisms are very similar to bacterial ones and they do cause problems. But that's something for microbiology and infectious diseases later on. Good. So those are topoisomerases. But there are other mechanisms through which DNA needs to be moved around, especially during cell division. And a very important structure that is required for cell division are microtubules. So we need functioning microtubules for cell division because microtubules are the basis for the mitotic spindle. Right? So if we can interfere with microtubule action, we can stop cells from dividing. Again, it's going to di stop dividing all cells. It's not specific to cancer cells, but we can use that because cancer cells, we, you know, we want to specifically stop them, so uh, it can be helpful. So these microtubule agents once again come in two flavors, okay? We have microtubule agents or anti-microtubule agents that stop the polymerization of microtubules, the formation of microtubules, and then we have agents that stop the depolymerization of microtubules. And either of those will, in effect, stop the proliferation of cells because in order for the mitotic spindle to function, it has to grow and then it has to depolymerize at the same time. Okay? So on either side, if we block it, it will have a similar effect. Okay? The first group, the ones that inhibit the, um, the polymerization, microtubule polymerization, we have vinca alkal alkaloids. Sorry. Vinca alkaloids. Vinca is the name of the plant from which they are isolated. Okay? It's called Vinca rosa. It's a tropical plant. And the best known is Vincristine and Vimblastine. So Vincristine and Vimblastine are two representatives of the Vinca, Vinca alkaloids and they all inhibit the polymerization of microtubules. So they stop the mitotic spindle from growing. On the other side, so stopping microtubules from depolymerization, are the taxanes. Taxanes, which again are named after the plant from which they are isolated, which is called taxus. Does anyone know what this taxus thing is? Hmm? 
Yeah, it's a big bush. Okay, evergreen. Okay, in English it's called yew. Like so. Okay, it's a, there are a few of them in the hospital here. Okay, they have these little red fruit on them. Very toxic. Yes, they are very toxic. Apart from the red bits, the red bits are the only parts that are not toxic. The rest of the compound is toxic. Um, anyway, this is, this is actually isolated from a different <coughs> species. Okay, so you wouldn't find taxanes in these bushes here, but it's, it's very closely similar. And the, the mostly used compound is called paclitaxel. Paclitaxel. It's a taxane called paclitaxel. So paclitaxel will stop the depolymerization and vincalcaloids the polymerization, but we use them to, to achieve the, uh, the same effect, basically disrupting the mitotic spindle. Yes? The what? Taxol is the company name, is the brand of paclitaxel. So paclitaxel is sold as taxol, okay? But now you can get generic paclitaxel as well. Right. Good. In the last bit of the lecture, I want to very briefly talk about three groups of drugs, but we'll go through them relatively quickly, okay? One group are hormone treatments. So as we said in the beginning, many cancer cells are just oblivious to any kind of hormonal or signaling you know, molecules, they don't care. But there are some cancers that are actually very sensitive to some hormones. For example, some subtypes of breast cancer are very sensitive to estrogens, and some subtypes of prostate cancer are very sensitive to androgens, to testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, and they need it in order to grow. Again, it's not all breast cancers and not all um, prostate cancers, but some of them do. And if in a patient we can detect that their cancer is sensitive to estrogen or androgen, depending on which one it is, we can interfere with this action of these hormones usually by using antagonists of the receptors. So we can use antagonists of estrogen receptors and antagonists of androgen receptors to slow down the growth of these, uh, of these uh, tumors and sometimes even to start apoptosis because they are so dependent on this, uh, on this uh, hormone signal that they just start dying if we, if we inhibit that. Again, it's a relatively small proportion of them, but there these, these hormone treatments can be very effective. The most commonly used anti-estrogen is called tamoxifen. It's actually one of the older ones, but it's still, it's still quite wide, widely used. And from the, for the anti-androgens, I'll just mention flutamide. But uh, yeah, there are other ones as well. Okay, so we have anti-estrogens, anti-androgens uh, to treat these hormone-dependent tumors, flutamide. In the past couple of decades, there has been an attempt, or there have been attempts, to develop more specific treatments for cancer. So all of these that we mentioned, as we said, target all the cells without any difference. Only we hope that the cancer cells will be unable to cope with it. But they, they really inhibit or you know, interfere with, with the growth of whole cells. But scientists have been trying to develop very specific treatments only for the specific cancer cells. And there do exist quite a few, and in the past five years, they emerged many, many more very specific treatments. The first one that was used, and is still used clinically, was called imatinib, or the company name is called Gleevec. And this was used to treat, and still used to treat, chronic myeloid leukemia. What is special about chronic myeloid leukemia? There's some special... It has? It, it can do, but there's some, some chromosomal... Okay, so there's some transposition there, and it creates a fusion protein, which is the oncogen behind it, the BCR able, right? The BCR able fusion protein. And imatinib was specifically developed to block the function of this fusion protein, only of this fusion protein. So it's a specific inhibitor of this BCR-able fusion protein. 
So if you give imatinib, the theory is that it should, have no, it should have no effect in normal cells because they do not have this fusion protein. It will only act in the leukemia cells where we block the function of this oncogen. And it does indeed work. It doesn't always work forever, okay? So some of the, uh, the cells can uh, acquire other mutations that will actually overcome the effect. But it's, it's, it was definitely the first or one of the first very specific treatments and still used in, in chronic mild le leukemia patients nowadays. Now, as I said, in the past few years, five years maybe, many, many other inhibitors of very specific tyrosine kinases have been developed. Their clinical effect so far is a little bit disappointing, okay? So there have been attempts for malignant melanoma, et cetera, to really target the specific oncogens. It doesn't seem to work for whatever reason as well as people expected. But I do believe that by the time your doctors, and maybe some of you will do oncology, um, that these specific treatments will be the most used treatments probably together with the next one. Uh, and what will happen is that basically you'll take a sample from the patient's tumor, you'll sequence the mutated genome, you'll find out what's specific to this tumor, and then you'll design a personalized mix of all these inhibitors just specifically for this one tumor. Nowadays, it's still not quite possible. It's very expensive to do it. But by the time you graduate, it will definitely be the way that cancer will be treated, okay? So for each patient, there will be a specific mix of molecules that will be targeted for their, uh, for their tumor. And sorry, I think I need a couple more minutes, uh, literally a couple more minutes, to talk about the, uh, the uh, immunotherapy. Because immunotherapy was something that was tried for decades, okay? Because people said, well, what better way to get away with, uh, to, to remove cancer than to use the immune system? Because with the mutations, these cells actually have different antigens, okay? So the theory was, well, the immune system should just clear them, right? Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. It doesn't seem to happen. And people have been studying, again, for decades, why doesn't the immune system attack it? It was discovered only maybe 10 years ago uh, that many cancer cells actually put special ligands on their membranes that inhibit the function of white blood cells. So the T cytotoxic C lymphocytes, they come to cancer, they recognize that there's something wrong with it, but then the cancer shows them a ligand which stops them from actually attacking them, okay? And this is a very effective method by which these cancer, cancer, uh, cancer cells and tumors can protect themselves from the attack of the immune system. In fact, these ligands, these molecules that stop the action of white blood cells, of, of lymphocytes, are not developed by cancer. They are actually in, normally present in our body, and their normal function is to prevent autoimmune diseases. Okay? So when a deranged T lymphocyte would come to a normal cell and try to attack it, the cell would say, no, 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 I'm, I'm a normal cell, don't attack me, and that prevents autoimmune diseases. But cancer can hijack this mechanism, and even though it's not a normal cell, it can stop white blood cells from, uh, from attacking it. The main two molecules that so far, the main two ligands, no, well, actually, the main two receptors on the white blood cells that detect these don't attack me ligands are CTAL, Sorry, CTLA4 uh, and PD1. So they're weird names, okay? As you probably know, in most immune, immunology related things, there are just weird abbreviations. So CTLA4 and PD1 are the receptors on the white blood cells which are there and just are looking for ligands. And when the ligand, come, the, uh, when the ligand comes, the white blood cells just shuts off, okay? And says, okay, I will not attack this. In the past couple of years, specific antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, have been developed against these molecules, which basically bind to these, uh, to these receptors and prevent them from being activated by these ligands. So basically, they remove the breaks on the immune system so that it can start attacking tumors. And indeed, the antibodies against these two molecules have, been, have produced a revolution in the treatment of cancer. In a depending on the tumor, relatively small subset of patients, they caused a, an incredible results, okay? Uh, incre incredible results. There, there have been cases of uh, people with 
severely metastasized uh, malignant melanoma where the metastases were just everywhere in the body. And after a few infusions of these, of these antibodies, the cancer was gone completely because the immune system just destroyed it. It still does not happen in all patients. And in fact, for most clinical trials, it was between 20, 30% of patients that have these dramatic responses. Unfortunately, still about 70%, again, depending on the tumor, are not responsive. And there are some tumors that are so good in evading the immune system where these molecules do not work at all. However, the research is continuing, and new techniques that tumors use to, pre to protect themselves from the immune system have been discovered. And I think, together with the targeted treatments that I just talked about, the immune treatments are probably going to be the next uh, big thing in the treatment of cancer. Okay, so again, by the time you graduate, I think these two things will be how, will be how cancer will be treated. And these very toxic, horrible chemotherapeutic agents will probably be used less and less. Still, I think it was good to talk about them because I think they connect quite nicely to all the knowledge that, that you gained in this course. All right, any questions? No questions? All right. Well, since this was probably the last lecture that we had together, so good luck with the exam, and I'll see you next year.